So welcome, thank you for joining us today. We are excited to talk about The Whiskey Thieves with author Eric Simonic. If you have questions about our discussion, you can put, post them in the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the program. Eric Simonic is a professor of chemistry at Texas Christian University. The Whiskey Thieves is his first novel. He lives in Fort Worth with his wife, four boys, and two cats. Welcome. We're so glad to have you. Would you like to get start with telling us a little bit about the book and maybe reading a short passage? Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to do this. This is this is a first for me. Uh, what would you, I'm sorry, you would like me to, to start by reading a, a short yeah. passage? Just tell us a little, a brief little about the book and then read your, and read a pa the passage. Yeah. Sure. So, so the book is titled The Whiskey Thieves, uh, An American Adventure in 1871. It uh, traces the story of, of two protagonists, one named Jamil, the other named Rolf, as they travel to St. Louis, presumably on a vacation, uh, only to find themselves embroiled in uh, the whiskey scandal, which was one of the many scandals that marred the Grant presidency shortly after the Civil War. Their task ultimately is to discover how a whiskey distillery in Peoria, which was at once the whiskey capital of the world, um, was, was making off with whiskey. So um, I, I can certainly tell you a little bit about, uh, read a little bit about the story if you'd like, or would you like more detail? Yep, let's read about the story. That sounds great. Okay, so, so uh, I, I picked a, a short portion uh, once they've arrived in St. Louis, which is Jamil's hometown. And uh, he's gone to the show and he's gone to the show as a guest of a, of a famous, a famous woman of the time. And uh, this occurs during intermission. Well, the first half of the play was everything that Jamil expected from a master of American theater. Intermission offered the greatest drama. Rosa located the most conspicuous of inconspicuous corners and led Jamil to it. Jamil played his part, his back turned to the gallery throngs. Rosa smiled sweetly at him and offered commentary on the people behind his back. Jamil noticed that occasionally she would pause and offer a cautious wave that acted to acknowledge and dissuade approach. When one acquaintance failed to heed Rosa's request for privacy, Rosa asked Jamil to find them champagne. As he returned with two flutes of bubbles, he was a recipient of the wave from Rosa. And if on cue, Rosa's companion turned to look towards Jamil. Understanding the game, Jamil played his role and intentionally failed to become invisible. With a squeeze of an arm, and whispers shared between ears, Rosa's guest departed, leaving space for Jamil to approach, but not before the woman offered Jamil a smile and a wink. Jamil watched her move by them, brushing his arm slightly as she passed through the crowd which seemed to part for her. The woman demonstrated similar command of character and constitution as Rosa, but fell short in beauty. As the woman returned to her tuxedoed partner, the champagne glass in Jamil's left hand dropped. The glass was neither slippery nor had Jamil been bumped. Standing beside her tuxedo partner, was a small fellow that bore uncanny resemblance to the man Jamil had chased on the train. So I love this scene. Um, I'm so glad you chose this one as your, uh, I was like, you're going to read because this whole section was just so hilarious to me. So um, I, I'm, I'm glad that you, that you chose that one. So I want to start by, I really loved your characters of Jamil and Roth. Um, can you talk about their characters and the choices you made around them? I can try. It, 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 it's very much like talking about oneself, where, where I think I know who they are, but I'm actually very interested in, 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 in knowing who, who you think they are as well, because they might turn out to be very different people, but I'm glad you like them. So, so Rolf, uh, sorry, Jamil. Jamil is, was to be the main character. Um, he, he's about 20 years old. Um, it is 1871. The Civil War has been over for a few years. Um, he grows up in St. Louis. He's, he's six feet tall, but even at six feet, he actually grows up in the shadow of Joseph Pulitzer, uh, the Pulitzer of Pulitzer Prizes, who actually made his start in St. Louis as well. The route by which Pulitzer gets to St. Louis is actually interesting historically. Both he and uh, Pulitzer are Republicans, and uh, Jamil leans heavily towards Grant, and Pulitzer um, sensitive to scandal and, and other issues is leaning towards a more moderate candidate, uh, Horace Greeley, for instance. And so there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of foment in, in the area because Grant is going to be coming up for re-election and, and no one's quite clear as to which Republican best represents the interests of the country. Um, 
I think as, as an effort, I don't know exactly why he does it, but um, Jamil, Jamil sticks to Grant maybe because uh, Pulitzer doesn't. And he looks for, for a way to distinguish himself out of the shadow of this person who now not only has established um, some uh, fame as a, as a newspaper reporter, not to the extent of the fame that he'll, he'll generate in New York, which, which is why we all know him. Um, but uh, and he, he, wants to, he wants to define himself. And so um, he decides to go after Pulitzer's candidate, which is Horace Greeley. And Horace Greeley, from the best of my reading of history, is, is pretty much as saintly a politician as one can be. Um, but Jamil, confused, thinks, thinks or looks for other reasons. Um, during this time, you know, Jamil falls in love and his, his bride, his paramour, um, convinces him that he needs to get out of Pulitzer's grasp and move to New York City and start afresh and leave this idea of, of, uh, of writing behind, get a job and raise a family. He is, I think, at heart a, a good, good guy, just a little misguided and lost. And I, I can relate to that, or at least I've been able to relate to that episodically throughout my own lives. Um, Ultimately, Jamil takes Rolf to St. Louis. And so this question of, you know, who's Rolf? So and if Jamil is to chase Greeley to find dirt on Greeley, which, which he never discovers, it turns out, um, he needs a place to live, not only in New York City, but also in Washington, because Greeley spends his time at both places. And uh, Jamil's poor. And he, he's able to arrange uh, an occupation, being a live-in tutor for, for a wealthy family in D.C., and the oldest child in this family of four is, is a boy named Rolf. And on interviewing for this job, he pr makes promises to take Rolf to, to the West, to St. Louis, uh, and Rolf seizes upon them. And at some point now in the story, two years in, um, it's time to go. And so they head off on what should be just a sightseeing trip to take Rolf to the frontier. St. Louis at the time was actually thought to be the nation's next capital. Washington is not so centrally located. The British had burned it down, well, at least in the, a few years earlier. Uh, and so they thought, well, maybe moving the capital to St. Louis would be an idea. And uh, historically, you know, th these, these arguments took place. It, it obviously never happened. But as the gateway to the West um, and St. Louis being the fourth largest city in the country at the time, um, Chicago was a close fifth. It was, it was an interesting metropolis. And, and, and so they go. And uh, Rolf is, he reminds me a lot of, of my boys, right? A lot of passion, a lot of energy, and um, looking for, for places to focus this talent and ability. And it turns out that Rolf, Rolf can draw, and now he's learning to write. So, so that, I think those are the characters in a nutshell. Why did you like them? Or did so, I get them right? Do I know who they are? Who are they really? <laughs> so I liked them because I think it's this this interesting thing where Ralph really looks up to Jamil as if he's kind of made his place in the world. But in reality, Jamil hasn't really made his place in the world yet. Um, and I also um, thought it was really interesting the the uh, the role that drawing plays that. Rolf really wants to be a reporter, but in a lot of ways, he draws his, his, he does, he draws as well. And I think that's kind of a, I'm always uh, fascinated by political cartoons. And so I, I thought that was really kind of an interesting sort of uh, uh, way to kind of bring in, you know, the news, but in, in a different way and in a, in a, and in a skill and that Rolf kind of he's learning a skill along the way um, in addition to getting up to some hijinks that you know that kids get up to um, and I also thought it was really interesting that you know um, in in that world being 20 is you know really an adult and you know so you're allowed to to take this relatively younger child with you wherever but I think in today's world we would like a is that are you really going to let your you know your your child travel across various states and and be completely out of contact with um 
this 20 year old man that, that it doesn't seem like his, his parents know him, but they don't always know him. So I just, I find that's always, I, I just found that was really interesting and kind of an interesting way to, uh, to go on an adventure. Um, but to have these two kind of not close in age characters kind of doing that together. 20 and 14. You're right. I think that that's interesting that 20 is you're, you're supposed to be an adult by age 20 back in the day. And uh, my oldest son is 20 and, and he's very much an adult. And while I would let him travel with my 14 year old anywhere, you know, I, I can see that there, yeah, I can see that there's some tension there. I, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting comment that you've made. And this idea of Ralph actually perceiving Jamil to know what's going on is, I mean, it's, it's the furthest thing from the truth, right? I, I, I tell people all the time, it's a line from one of Kurt Vonnegut's uh, commencement day speeches that Vonnegut claims that he didn't know anything more than anyone else. He just got there earlier. And so he's just got a little bit of experience on his side. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, um, yeah, I just think it's really interesting that just that whole, sure, I know what I'm doing, but, you know, here's all these crazy things. I've been tailing this guy for two years and I've been trying to find some scandal about him, but I absolutely know, I absolutely know what's going on, right? Um, I just think that's really interesting. That's one of the, one of the things I liked about him a lot. Well, thank you. Um, and so I also want to talk about Elena. Um, I, her, her backstory is really compelling to me in the fact that she's a woman working for the Pinkertons. Um, there's a story of some spy work she's done during the civil war. And obviously she's not a real person, but I was wondering how much of her is based on historical facts and how much is fiction. I think that it's, it's, I think it's safest to say that it's largely fiction. Um, uh, certainly Alan Pinkerton is, is real. The Pinkerton detective agents were, were the go-to group if there was a problem, right? If an insurance company got uh, held out because a safe was stolen or if someone needed protecting, you called the Pinkertons. Um, Pinkerton made his, his fame by keeping Lincoln from being assassinated while Lincoln was moving to the White House to take up the presidency. Because at the time, Maryland's a slave state and he's got to make his way through Maryland. And the, the connections are such that you arrive in one train station and have to take a carriage across town to get to the next train station. And so this Baltimore plot is, I think, where, where Pinkerton ultimately makes you know, his debut on, on the scene. Pinkerton moves back to Chicago. He opens up the detective agency and... Uh, and, and hire some very interesting people. And, and amongst them are a, a handful of women. I'm not gonna remember all of the names uh, that I, I later found out, um, but uh, Hattie, Hattie Lawson is, is one of them. And, and she played a, a role in the Civil War as a spy as well. And in fact, I think I, think I have Elena meet Hattie or someone who looks like Hattie during, during the story. Um, the name Cutler is, is an authentic name. There were a handful of families, four or five, that actually settled the Northwest Territories. In 1871, or prior to, just prior to 1871, the Northwest Territories are Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan, right? Um, I would have definitely missed that question on an AP test <laughs> or on any history test, right? Um, but the Northwest Territories is that land between you know, the, the original states and the Mississippi River which was set as our boundary by the Treaty of Paris um, with the British. The, uh, and so the Cutlers are one of these founding families. They were called the Immortals. There were 48 of them. And essentially to get into what is now the Middle West, you, you went through Marietta, Ohio. Uh, I had occasion to, to visit Marietta to give a talk on, on whiskey, it turns out, and, uh, and got to see the place. And while I'm not sure that the b &O Railroad actually went through Marietta at the time, um, it came very close. And Marietta is actually really interesting for uh, a civilization that predates us by a couple thousand years. The Hopi culture actually 
lived in the area and built these great mounds and, and the remnants of these mounds are still available and it's uh, to see. And so it was just, it's an interesting place. But Elena, Elena uh, grows up in Marietta and is going to St. Louis because her uncle, who's going to become the president of Case University, um, has won an award at Wash U. And it turns out that there is a Cutler who would be, I guess, her uncle, if Elena was real, that took on the presidency of Case. Maybe it was Western. It was one of the two. They're now combined. Um, and was actually given an award, I think, in St. Louis, although I've had trouble refinding that fact. That's been the real challenge. You find all these interesting stories, and if I don't take careful notes, I can't find them again. It's terrible. <laughs> well, and so I think that's actually a good uh, segue for us to talk about the research process. So I know you have some slides to share. So while you're sharing your screen, um, <clears throat> I want to... Uh, my next question is, um, getting the details right when writing historical fiction is so important. Can you talk about your research process and how it influences the writing to make the reader feel like they're in 1870s St. Louis, Washington, or the other small towns along the rail line? Yes, it's, uh, it's fun. It, it's, it, it would be impossible, uh, except that, I mean, conveniently, there are so many boundaries that that exists, right? So we have to choose a, a place to start the story. And, and I knew that they were gonna go from somewhere on the East Coast, and it turns out to be Washington, uh, to St. Louis, because I, I like St. Louis. That was actually the heart of the Grant Whiskey scandal. So I knew it was gonna be in the 1870s. The scandal erupts and, and the indictments are handed down in 1875, but there were shenanigans going on beforehand. And so I wanted them to be sort of on the early side of the shenanigans. And uh, I knew they ultimately had to end up in Peoria. And, and so with those boundaries, um, really all I needed was a date to start with. And it would have been completely capricious to choose a date, but it was handed to me. Uh, and, uh, and I needed a way for them to get there and it had to be by train. And, and, and so that's sort of how it, how it goes. And so um, I think the primary scoundrel and historians will agree. So I'm a, I'm a chemist, okay. so. Full disclosure, right? I'm not a historian, I'm a chemist. Uh, but uh, the Grant whiskey scandal was, uh, was an effort to fund the reelection campaign of Grant in 1872, 1874, um, with revenue stolen from the treasury. So they're gonna use whiskey tax money to fund his candidacy. And, and I find this compelling because, you know, shenanigans in politics is nothing new. It's all been done before. We find out about it a little quicker. And in fact, it actually might be a little bit more um, uh, civilized nowadays than it was back then. But of, of the 200 some indictments, um, a, a newspaper reporter in St. Louis named McKee, who has a role in the story, as well as John McDonald, um, are indicted. John McDonald is uh, pretty high up in, in the treasury. He is officially a supervisor and he's in charge of collecting all the revenues from the Middle West. And all of those revenues essentially constitute whiskey revenues. And whiskey taxes at the time constituted between, depending on the numbers I saw, between 25 and 50% of the federal budget, right? So income tax really wasn't a thing. It had gone out, it, it, there was a short income tax period after the civil war to pay for the war, they got rid of it. And so now they're running the country primarily on excise taxes and whiskey was one. So this fellow in the lower left-hand corner, John McDonald's indicted, he goes to prison. Um, and so he writes the tell-all. And he throws everybody under the bus, including Grant, saying, look, Grant knew about this. It's not me. I'm just taking my orders. I'm, I'm a good soldier. And his tell-all is actually, it's an interesting read. Uh, the, he's really articulate um, and organized and thoughtful. And I guess there's no reason to think that crooks can't be brilliant. But, you know, he, he was, he's, he's an interesting fellow. And in this story, and I've, I've sort of um, highlighted a couple of passages it, it sort of says that, you know, he's arguing that McKee, the newspaper reporter and another fellow are uh, arranging to see Grant through Grant's personal secretary, a guy named Babcock. Um, and they don't get responses to the invitation. So at some point in April, and that's where the date came from, April 15th, um, they all go out to Washington together. McKee and Ford go to dine at the White House. They did so, and then they grabbed uh, McDonald and they went back. 
They were staying at the Ebbett House, which was a place to stay a couple blocks off from the White House. And so this was my starting point. I knew they were leaving on April 15th and I just had to get them to St. Louis. So I had about two weeks worth of time that I had to cover to get to St. Louis and up to Peoria. And, and so that's sort of how it, how it came together. Um, we, we talked a little bit about characters. There's this small man I alluded to, Moosey. I told you about John McDonald, the supervisor. And then, you know, I just packed in as many interesting people as I could. My good friend, uh, Mary Rogers, um, gave me so much great advice and support for this whole process. And, and uh, it would have been a better book had I taken all of her suggestions. But uh, I squeezed in as many interesting people as I could find. Um, Grant and Greeley, Pulitzer McKee, um, Rankin, um, the, you know, the American theater godfather is this fellow named uh, McKee Rankin. And um, the Drew family and the Barrymore family actually derive from this lineage. And so the fact that you can actually trace these strings to one of the two masters of American theater in 1871, um, it's, there's just so many really interesting stories out there and so many fun rabbit holes to run down, especially if you're stuck in the house during COVID, I guess, right? Um, Rosa was, uh, was a, a prominent woman uh, married to the rabbi uh, in, in St. Louis, who he goes to the theater with. Um, Charles Gates Dawes is someone else who I, we bump into. Um, he was a vice president of the United States. Jamil and Rolf meet him as a boy hauling luggage on a train stop in Marietta. It's where he grew up. Um, Charles Dawes ultimately wins the Nobel Peace Prize for reparations after World War I. We also meet the Reno gang. Um, so just a lot of interesting stuff. You know, you look at a map of 1871 because that's, I'm going to start them in Washington. And I see this this thing along the bottom and there's like a canal. And I didn't know that Washington was supposed to have canals like the great cities of Europe and Venice. It didn't work, it's filled with mosquitoes and trash and dead bodies. And so in 1871 and 72, they're, they're in the process of, of trying to fill it in. And so this may be one of the cases where I, I heeded Mary's advice and I had, a, I think, multiple, multiple paragraphs about the guy who was filling in the canals and paving the streets and getting rid of the wooden sidewalks and you just don't get to meet him. And I don't think anyone's better, worse off for it. But, you know, so there, there's, there's an anchor for history. You know, I, I have to get them to, to St. Louis. How do you get there? You go on the Baltimore and Ohio or the Pennsylvania. You got to choose the B&O because that's the coolest block in Monopoly, right? That's one of the ones you, you learn. And, and so this is a, an old railroad map. And every three miles from Washington in the lower left to Baltimore towards the center is this little town. And so just, just Google um, you know, what's going on. And when one Google Savage, you, you find a picture of the, the only surviving iron bridge in, in the world built by a fellow named Bowman and who lived about that time. Up until this point, bridges are wood that fall apart or they're stone, which take forever. And Bowman introduced iron bridges. Um, a little further up the road is uh, a viaduct called the Thomas Viaduct, which is named for the first president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And it's uh, it's beautiful. And, you know, in the process of giving lectures on chemistry and whiskey, I got to visit some of these places. And, and so there's the Bowman Trust Bridge and uh, a little bit of historical detail. And it's, uh, it's at this, the, the Savage Mill. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, sort of on my, my bucket list of places to go, but, you know, if, if you're out in the woods, this is, this is a wonderful stop. And I think this is part of the fun. There are so many really neat, interesting places that we walk by every day that we take for granted um, that have a lot of heart and a lot of story in them. And discovering these stories was a, was a source of great joy for me. And, and I hope the people who read them enjoyed them as, as well. Um, if you go to the, the, the Thomas Viaduct today, it, it's part of a state park but most of the state park is unkempt and there are just rolling fields of, of scrub and, and, and short trees. But a hundred years ago, or 150 years ago, actually, almost to the day, um, is, uh, was this beautiful hotel, right? And you, you walk through this area now and, and, and there's nothing, there's no sign of the majesty that was once there. That obelisk is a, a monument to Thomas, the first president of that Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And if you look at it today, well, there's the river again. And I mean, it's, it's really just a magnet for graffiti. And one wonders, well, why is it still there? People are just going to uh, desecrate it. Well, I guess it's for chemists to, to run into 150 years later. I'd wonder well, what, what's going on with that. So I think that was a lot of the joy. 
you know, we, they travel across the country and uh, they make their way through parts of the, the world that, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty unfamiliar with. But again, um, with the blessing of my wife and an opportunity to speak in the area, you know, we got to trace this path from Baltimore, which is over here, you know, through Harper's Ferry. I've heard of Harper's Ferry. I think I had to answer questions about it at one point, but, you know, now I'm going to have to visit it for sure. And we go through and we get to a town called Piedmont, which is right here on the Maryland, uh, West Virginia border. And Piedmont actually is important historically because it starts a, a, a section of railroad track called the 17 mile grade, which of course I'd never heard of. And it's essentially 17 miles of the most dangerous railroad track in, in the in the in the country at this point, and potentially maybe still today, although much less so. Um, it was that section where the trains had to climb essentially a thousand feet over 17 miles to get from the coastal plain up over the Appalachians onto the, the Appalachian Plains into the Midwest. And so going up was not so much a problem, but coming back down was because if the train slipped, you know, everybody was in trouble. And so I got to drive through this area and it turns out that there's, there's not much left there uh, to, show, to show the history, which at some level is, is, is too bad, I think. I think now I'm also potentially stuck. I can make this work. I am a little bit locked up. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I think the last time when we tested it, you had to take that pin mark off for it to let you move forward. Yeah, I, I the, hit my cursor. There we go. Now we're back. So, <laughs> so they make it up the, the, this, uh, this 17 mile grade. And, and so I, I drove through the countryside trying to find it. And it's, it's a beautiful part of the country. What's going on? We did dry run this, right? So we, we know this does work. Sometimes I just unshare and reshare. It won't, it won't even let me unshare. That's what I was, I was praying to oh, do. No. We're going to be stuck staring at a map of Maryland for the rest of the day. What am I doing here? Um, I guess I could keep talking while I, while I, while I'm going to, I'm going to unshare you. Hold oh, on. pick me out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. That's the last of my drawing. I promise. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to pick something to, to share for a second and then I'm going to unshare. So then you can get back in. Okay. Okay. No more. No Technology. more. Technology. <laughs> it was a good idea while it lasted. <laughs> All right. There we go. So, so we make it up, uh, you know, up this 17 mile grade. And I turned 50 just a, a, a few years ago. And my wife, who's an amazing editor, she worked on this book tirelessly, uh, threw me a wonderful party. And because I teach a course at Whiskey at TCU, everybody brought a, a bottle of whiskey. And until that point, I wasn't a big drinker, um, but to, 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 to celebrate all this whiskey, we have a whiskey night. And I guess the purpose of the story is to say that a, a, a new dear friend uh, who also had input in the book actually worked for BNSF. And, and he was tickled pink that the 17 mile grade was, was finally given its due. Ultimately, they, they make it to Grafton. Grafton is essentially, um, uh, a critical stop in, in, in the in the rail trip west, um, and it's it's largely forgotten. They're not quite sure why it's called Grafton. It might be because the citizens of of West Virginia, or I guess it was Virginia at the time, um, essentially blackmailed BNO to to build the railroad in the way they wanted it built. Um, the chief engineer for BNO was named Grafton. There there are a lot of rumors as to why the name is is what it is. Um, this is sort of the picture of the 17 mile grade. It's it looks somewhat genteel. It's hard to believe that it's got such a terrible reputation. And the top of the 17 mile grade at some elevation, I think it's 17, 1700 feet is Altamont. And now the only marker for Altamont is the name of a road and a stop sign. So, you know, a lot of things change in 150 years. This, this is Piedmont, just beautiful, beautiful countryside. We make our way across West Virginia. This is Grafton. This, is a, this was the premier hotel uh, on the western side of the Appalachians at the time. It was built by the BNL Railroad because people would overnight in the hotel. And uh, now it's just an abandoned building that's largely neglected and ignored. 
um, these are uh, the mounds that I referred to earlier at Marietta. And so I had to include Marietta in the story, although again, I'm not sure that the bridge from Harmar on one side of the Muskegon uh, to, to Marietta was in operation, but you know, it's artistic license, I think. They make their way across to St. Louis and ultimately Peoria, going through what the town is, was once called Porkopolis, um, that's uh, Cincinnati, and through all these small towns and then ultimately to where I grew up. Uh, along the way, again, I just sort of looked for interesting bits about all of these towns. Um, one of the towns is called Seymour. And if you look at a, a Google depiction of Seymour, the town right next to it is called Hangman Crossing. So, so I mean, that's got to be interesting. And so, you know, what's mm -hmm. Hangman Crossing? What's, what's Jackson County known for? Well, it turns out that the first recorded train robbery in history happened in Indiana by the Reno gang. And it turns out the, the Pinkertons were involved in tracking these people down. And so all of a sudden, not surprisingly, maybe, right, this, this, uh, this garden of, of forking paths, that's, that's what Borges would say, um, you know, brings all these people back together again, right? And so the first evidence of, of vigilantism in, in America is in the 18, late 1860s, right, where they essentially busted the Renos out of jail, the citizens, and, and strung them up. And... Uh, that's Hangman's Crossing. So, you know, a lot of this has been, is fun. And with the internet and with the Library of Congress, and so a lot of the references also come from the Library of Congress, which you can search for free. And again, all sorts of wonderful rabbit holes to go down. Love that. All right, let's see. Um, so you, you, you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but I want to kind of go back. Um, so I read the, the historical notes at the end and about the whiskey ring scandal, which I will admit I have never heard of. Um, and I just, I, I think it's really interesting that we, 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 we've kind of left a period in time in politics where there's lots of questions about what's going on with the money. Um, and then here we have this situation where they're trying to finance a, <laughs> Uh, you know, a re-election campaign by stealing taxes from the government. Um, and so I know that the note said something like 200 people were indicted um, and nobody's really sure how much Grant knew, but can you, can you kind of talk about the history surrounding the events a little bit more? Sure. Um we talk about this in the whiskey class. It, it, it's just, it's, it's such a nice lens to look at politics today through, as, as, you, as you allude to. Um, so Grant needs to be reelected. He needs money to do it. The money has to come from somewhere, somebody. And I think most historians think that it's, it's primarily um, McDonald decides that he's just going to start underreporting whiskey production He'll, he'll give the distillery who's co 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 cooperating a cut. And um, again, these taxes are substantial, a third of the, the national budget. And all of the tax money goes essentially through his hands because all of the whiskey, for the most part, is produced in the Middle West because that's where all the corn is grown. Um, and, and, and so they, they start siphoning off money. And, and one of the other individuals involved is a fellow named uh, McKee who runs the St. Louis Democrat newspaper. Um, back in the day, if, if you ran a newspaper, you were, and I guess what's the word, an influencer, right? <laughs> they, were, they were the equivalent of today's uh, social media moguls. Uh, and so he had power and he had power to get people elected and unelected. And, and so he was in on this, this fundraising campaign. Presumably there were rewards for him as well. He too was indicted and found guilty. Um, interestingly, uh, Grant actually had heard rumors that there was shenanigans going on and, and appointed uh, a guy named Bristow to investigate. And, and Bristow was really good at his job and he, and he found the dirt. Um, he found the dirt actually by working with a newspaper reporter. There was a fellow named Myron Colony who actually worked at a rival newspaper in St. Louis. And that, those would be interesting stories to, to know more about what was going on in the newspaper wars back in the day. Mm. But Myron Colony just did the math. And, you know, it's number of bushels of corn that go in and number of barrels of whiskey that go out. And on average, you know, you get about three and a half barrels. Uh, let's see, three and a half bushels gives you a barrel. 
and, and some some distilleries were really efficient, had 3.8, and then every once in a while a distillery would have 3.1. That's and you wonder, I mean, are they really bad at their job or what's going on? Um, they would bribe the people that number the barrels, right? So you'd have two barrels number two. And that would mean that one barrel was for the grant re-election campaign and one barrel was, was for the general consumption. And so there are all sorts of stories that, that come out of this. Ultimately, Grant sense, uh, sets a number of records as a president. Um, most scholars actually have changed their perception of Grant and think that he was actually a terrific president um, through today's lens. I think his reputation, as I understand it, as a chemist is, is now growing again, mostly, mostly based on his efforts in social justice. Um, but his personal secretary, Babcock, who is essentially implicated in almost all of the scandals that marred Grant's presidency, and I think there are at least eight large ones, ultimately is, uh, is tried and uh, Grant actually testifies on his behalf. And so he's the only sitting president that's actually ever been deposed in a criminal trial. Um, Babcock is actually acquitted, um, and he, uh, he, but he loses his job as Grant's secretary. And he's made the official lighthouse inspector of the US government. He drowned somewhere in Florida a couple years later. And there's probably a story there too, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's. That's interesting. It's also interesting that he would testify on his behalf instead of saying, instead of distancing himself from him, right? Oh, here's this person in my cabinet, this close person. Um, I was not responsible. It was him. That's very, in, it's very interesting that um, he he testified for him. Um, that's fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. From, from, from the little I, that I've read, Grant, Grant was loyal to a fault. And, and, and many claim that that's why he got into so much trouble, that he, he trusted the people around him to be um, honest and faithful and um, with compasses that are morally aligned. And uh, I just, it just wasn't the case, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, I have to say it's probably one of the most creative ways uh, I can think of to, to fund a campaign, but I guess it's not like fundraising was as easy as it is today, right? Like, how would you, how would you even donate to a presidential campaign in the 1870s? I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Right. I mean, it, and, and I guess it also is kind of a, uh, an interesting testament to just in, you know, we're talking a hundred years, right. Between Washington being president and Grant being president, the difference in campaigning as well. The country's bigger now. How do you reach all these people? Um, you still have the problem of uh, news not traveling quickly. So, I mean, I, ju I just think it's really interesting that their solution to that was, we'll just steal money from the government. <laughs> um, but, you know, I also guess um, it's not, I would assume it's not the first time up to that point that members of the government or cabinet uh, were accused of defrauding the the government for their own their own needs. I mean, is it wasn't at some point Hamilton even accused of that? You mean the opera star, the 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 the, the star on stage? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I think that from from my, my understanding of Hamilton is sort of limited to the Broadway musical. But I, I think that those those issues were levied against Hamilton by Jefferson, but. Uh, yeah, I think that there's creative accounting everywhere. It's pervasive. It's today. It still makes the news. I mean, I grew up in when the Iran Contra affair was going on, and so I remember those trials. Yeah, and so it's uh, yeah, yeah. But I think it's interesting how you don't, unless you study history, you don't understand how history re repeats that stuff, right? We think oh, this thing that's happening now, there's, this is this huge scandal that's never happened before. But 
that's not most probably really reality, right? It, it's just a different form. Um, it's just different. I think it's one of the really great things about historical fiction is because it's a way to get into the, the history we don't know about without feeling like, you know, you're reading a dry history book. I'm glad you say that. I tried to get my, my, my sons to read the book and, and, and they have, but, but my youngest, who is a gem, um, got through the first chapter and then said, dad, I don't like social studies. <laughs> but he will, he will. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you might be a few more years, yeah. Yep. Um, uh, so you've alluded to this for a, co a, a couple of times. Um, I know your research at TCU revolves around the science of whiskey, which I also find really fascinating. Um, can you talk about that research and then how you kind of spawned that into this book as well? Um, certainly. Uh, my research actually focuses on uh, designing cancer drugs. Oh. And, and, and when I moved to TCU, they gave me an opportunity to, to create whatever class I wanted to to teach. And you look around and whiskey is really interesting. And so I figured, well, I could, I could teach a, a science course focused on whiskey. I spent 12 years at, at A&M and, and the course that I got to teach at A&M was my favorite and, and not many other people liked it, but we called it Cowboy Organic. And it was, it was a survey course of general chemistry and organic chemistry and biochemistry for, for um, agricultural economics majors, for forestry majors, the most interesting person in the class was a herpetologist who had a funny hat every day. Um, and I just loved working with those students. And so when I moved to TCU, I thought, wow, I should be even more selfish and, and teach a general science course and, and be able to, to work with not only sort of science and the periphery, but the entire population. And invariably, you know, it's, it's someone from the fine arts that crushes the class every semester. It's, uh, it's, but it wasn't always like that because it started as a, as a course that was just the science of whiskey and, and the student feedback was, you know, it's interesting, but it's too much science. And as a chemist, I'm comfortable with one hat on, but not with the history hat on. And I had two wonderful colleagues who coached me up in developing the science content, uh, the history content rather. And so we talk about certainly the Grant Whiskey uh, scandal. We talk about prohibition. We talk about the uh, Whiskey Rebellion, which almost ruined the country shortly after it was formed in, 18, uh, in 1791, 1794. And uh, I guess those are the, the four epics. And uh, it's, it's just been a tremendous treat to, to work with these really talented students and to, uh, to explore some interesting stories that you know, none of us are really all that aware of. Well, and you know, it's such a, it's such a moment, right, for niche distilleries and niche breweries um, that it's kind of this, uh, it's kind of an interesting way into chem chemistry, you know, um, as a uh, music and literature major, um, I can't begin to tell you how excited I was when I went back to college the second time and they offered uh, chemistry for non-science majors because uh, when I went through college the first time, that was not an option. And I failed chemistry one miserably because I could not, I actually couldn't do the math. It was, it was much less about the chemistry part itself but the actual math. So I, I think it's a really interesting way to, to get those science credits in that you absolutely need, but also in a format that you might actually be able to understand. I, th I think uh, I agree with you. Yeah, and I think, I think the students would agree as well. It, it's, uh, you know, if, if I go to a cocktail party and I tell people that I'm an organic chemist, the conversation sort of stops there, right? But if I tell them I teach a course on whiskey, I get to talk to people for a little bit while longer. <laughs> it's a benefit. But I mean, you can, you can make anything interesting if, if you can put it in context. And I think that the, the real failure we have as educators um, is that, you know, it, it's hard to put everything in context and still hit all of the, the, the details that, that need to be hit. And the course that you allude to, general chemistry, is, is probably the worst course for that, right? Because there's so much content and so many disparate themes that 
it's a real challenge. Well, and it was interesting because I really enjoyed chemistry in high school. But then when I got into it in college, I was like, yeah, I cannot. I can I I could not I could not solve any of the 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 equation stuff that we had to do. I'm like, I just I can't. I, I can't do this. So I was really excited when I went back the second time and they were like, oh, no, you don't have to take that. We have this other class for people who don't do science. I was like, yeah, that's the class for me. <laughs> the <laughs> and even then in lab, I think I had somebody who was like in accounting as my lab partner. And I was like, you get to do the math. <laughs> 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 when, when we do the, when we do the, the, the lab, you do the math part of the lab because I cannot that is not my, yeah, it's definitely not my forte. So I, I think I would have been thrilled to be able to take a, a class in, in, in whiskey. And I also think it's really interesting because, you know, when you're talking about it was 50% of the, the tax revenue at, at, in the 1870s, I, you know, there's a lot more to that than just the alcohol itself, right? There's so many other things about how it affects um, the economy and, and history and all of those things. And the Whiskey Rebellion, that's the one Washington sent in troops, correct? So Washington um, was the first standing president to actually lead an army into battle. It's not clear that he ever made it into the, the, the rough frontier of Western Pennsylvania, but uh, you know, the, the the settlers around Pittsburgh rebelled because Hamilton's tax on whiskey was essentially an income tax in their barter economy and the way that they had to pay and the way that they were, they were uh, taxed, the, the, the math um, was not in their favor. And so they're still not being paid for their efforts in the Revolutionary War. They're being ignored on the frontier and there are all sorts of problems there with the indigenous peoples as well as, well, scoundrels and uh, yeah. It almost ruined the country before it started. So fascinating. All right, well, we're running out of time. So uh, my last question is, are you working on anything new? I am, I am. So I'm, uh, I'm working on an American adventure in 1872. <laughs> and, and, and it features Jamil and Rolf and to a much larger extent, Elena, because everybody loves Elena. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> That is great. So um, uh, I'm going to, if you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat. And um, is there anything else that you want to tell us about the book that we didn't talk about? I, I think, I think we've, we've hit on a, a tremendous amount. You know, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's a really interesting way to think about today. When, when I was teaching the whiskey course you know, over these last few years, there, there was a, a long period of time, and this is before COVID, where it seemed like the country was just getting deeper and, and deeper into a mess and device, divisiveness. And there was really no reason for optimism amongst the students. It, it could never be this bad. And, and it turns out by, by, by looking at whiskey and by looking at what, what's gone before, you know, this isn't so bad. You know, we, we might be on a slight dip or maybe we're not climbing as fast, but, but things are still looking good for, for, um, for the country and, and uh, what we do. Certainly a lot of ways to, for improvement, but, um, but optimism, optimism has to try. All right. Well, on that, I want to thank you uh, for spending time with us today. I really appreciate it. Um, and if you want to purchase copies of the books, uh, you can get them from The Dock. The Dock is one of our local independent bookstores here in Fort Worth. Um, and this is their contact information on the screen. And we have a ton of author visits and some writing workshops uh, coming up over the summer. So if you would like to see what's coming up, um, you can visit our website. If you go to fortworthlibrary.org, and you, search, and you click on the search all programs button at the bottom of the calendar. You will then at the top see author visits and book signings. If you click on that link, it will give you everything that we have upcoming. And we update that very frequently. And so thank you for joining us. And uh, we hope that you have a great evening. Oh, we have a, 
<laughs> so your wife wants to know how does it feel to have such great kids? <laughs> I, I am a, a very lucky man. Great kids, a wonderfully supportive wife, and uh, yeah, a great life in Fort Worth at a great institution. Well, on that note, we are going to say good night. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.